You are welcome to this brief introduction to 1 Thessalonians 4.13-5.11, through 5.11, Facing the End Times. Saul of Tarsus, also known as the Apostle Paul, wrote this letter to young Christians in the city of Thessaloniki in about the year 50, that is, about 17 years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Let's get into it. These two chapters contain the Apostle Paul's earliest revelations about the coming return of Jesus Christ, when he wrote, The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and all the dead in Christ will rise first. And his famous promise that God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Paul wrote this epistle in the common Greek of the New Testament era, destined for a Greek reading audience. These verses were exceptionally well preserved across the centuries. Even so, some later copyists did introduce mistakes or slight variations. For example, in chapter 4, verse 15, one manuscript replaces the word Lord with Jesus. In 5.4, two manuscripts use the plural form thieves instead of the singular thief. And in 5.10, two manuscripts employ the preposition peri instead of huper. You may download this list of variants from a link provided in the description below. As part of the backstory to the writing of this epistle, Paul mentions the Day of the Lord. This was a technical term amongst Jewish believers, a recurring theme in the writings of the Hebrew prophets regarding a future time when Yahweh, or his Messiah, would come in power and glory to defeat Israel's enemies. This theme occurs in the 8th century writings of Amos, 7th century writings of Isaiah and Zephaniah, 6th century Zechariah, and the 5th century writings of the prophet Joel. Jesus' apostles, including Paul, made the day of the Lord part of the New Testament teaching for Christians, as evidenced in the books of Acts, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, and 2 Peter. Paul employs ordinary Greek terminology, sometimes with a special application to Christian truth. He speaks of those who sleep or are asleep, a euphemism for physical death. He said that when Jesus would arrive, we would all be caught up, that is, snatched, seized, taken suddenly or vehemently from earth to himself in the sky. He uses two terms for time, chronos and kairos, to emphasize that these will be historical events. He calls events to come upon the earth labor pains. This expression in Judaism referred to the messianic woes, the terrors and torments traditionally viewed as prelude to the coming of the messianic age, which Jews associated with the appearance of the human one, or son of man, at the end of history as the beginning of the end time woes. Jesus employed this term in Matthew 24 and in Mark 13 for the end times. In chapter 5, Paul again speaks of those who sleep, but using a different Greek term. And we are to be saved from the coming wrath, when God will show his strong displeasure and indignation directed at wrongdoing, with a focus on retribution, especially of God's future judgment, specifically qualified as punitive. A couple of points of grammar. Now, every language employs metaphor. 
a figure of speech whereby one word is used in place of another that resembles it in some way. Thus this passage speaks of sleep in two ways that do not mean resting at night. In chapter 4, to be asleep means to have died before the Lord's return. Whereas in chapter 5, sleep means to be indolent or indifferent, inattentive regarding the Lord's coming return. In verse 5, 8, the King James Bible exhorts believers to be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Whereas the more modern English Standard Version reads, be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love. Putting on is a Greek participle. In this verse, it occurs in what the Greeks called the aorist tense, which has no counterpart in English, often indicating that its action precedes the action of a main verb, in this case, the verb to be sober. The time of a verb in the aorist tense can only be inferred from its context. The outline of this passage is not particularly complex. After commending the Thessalonians for their Christian behavior and reviewing his ministry with them, Paul begins exhorting them in 4.1, Therefore we ask and urge you. In 4.12 and 5.1, Paul provides emotional support to his appeals by describing for them Jesus' teaching about the end times when God will raise them from death to dwell with him forever. Nearly every sentence in Greek literature begins with some kind of a conjunction, and this passage is no exception. In 4.13, the passage begins with the conjunction and, relating it to material earlier in the epistle. He appeals for them to grieve the loss of loved ones with hope for their resurrection, providing two reasons. Reason one, the old gospel truth of Jesus dying and rising, and second reason, newly revealed truth about the times of Jesus' coming, with a concluding inference, therefore encourage one another. But he continues with another and, appealing to them to recall end times truth that they had learned earlier. For two reasons again. One, believers remain attentive to the Lord's return. And secondly, Jesus has promised salvation instead of wrath for those who are waiting for him. And again, concluding, wherefore, encourage and edify one another. If you preach or teach this passage, or lead discussion groups on the passage, we recommend that you be ready to pose a number of queries about the text and then allow learners to discuss together how the text replies to your queries. So, for example, in verses 13 and 14, we ask, how do faith and hope work together? You should know the answers in advance so you can affirm those who answer correctly. And how can God bring with Jesus those who are still in the ground? You will find the reply to this in verse 17. Verses 15 and 17 beg the question, The dead and the living will neither be raptured nor rise until after what events happen first? Let them reply from the text, not from books by popular prophecy preachers. And then what will happen? Well, again, let them reply from the text. After having somebody read verse 18, you might ask them to discuss what is the emotional impact of these words on Christian believers? Whose ministry responsibility is it to explain these words to Christians? And why have Christians historically been so willing to risk their lives to defend others? Continuing into chapter 5, after verses 1 and 2, 
discuss together what is the day of the Lord, and who was it that taught that that day would come as a thief in the night, and what does that phrase mean? After verses 3 to 5, you might ask, why will Christians not be surprised by the day of the Lord? It's not because they won't be there. And verses 6 and 8 beg, what is the proper Christian attitude towards the end times? And what will protect Christians during the end times? After verses 9 and 10, what will happen to Christians who remain alive as the end times arrive? Then, what will happen to Christians who are not watching or staying sober when the Lord appears? And what will happen to those on earth after the Christians have departed? And after reading verse 11, you might discuss together, what is the emotional impact of this doctrine on Christian believers? And or whose ministry responsibility is it to explain these words to fellow Christians. As you teach, preach, or discuss this passage, you should underscore these historic Christian doctrines that were revealed or emphasized in this text. In chapters 4, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the authoritative word of the Lord Jesus, the return of the Lord Jesus to raise the dead, the actual coming resurrection of the righteous, its relation to the future day of the Lord, the cardinal virtues of faith, hope, and love, and, of course, the promise of salvation through Jesus' death and resurrection. In preparation for your coming Bible discussion group, we ask you to read through 1 Thessalonians 4.13-5.11 through 5, 11, once a day this week in different translations or other languages that you read. As you do so, observe instructions on how Christians are to behave, to experience, and to believe as the end times approach, jotting down other notes and queries that you want to discuss in your next Bible study session. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you richly as you learn this text, as you obey this text, and as you teach others to obey this text.